for promos or any business inquiries, contact us on Instagram or by email. The story of Michael Anderson and Telly Hankton, New Orleans. Camille, 61-year-old Curtis Matthews was gunned down in front of the Jazz Daiquiri Lounge on Saturday night. He suffered multiple gunshot wounds and died at the scene. We have learned that he is the brother of John Matthews, who testified against Telly Hankton at his last trial. He testified that he was 95 to 97 percent sure that it was indeed Hankton who gunned down Darnell Stewart in front of the Jazz Daiquiri Lounge back in 2008. In the 1900 block of Josephine Street, just about everyone is family. The Hankton family, labeled by law enforcement as a violent drug trafficking organization, but Hankton family members and neighbors say that characterization is both unfair and untrue. Don't listen to everything the media has to say, because the media don't know. If you was around these, around the Hankton family, you would know them, and it's everything he is not the truth. Still, in an early morning sweep, federal agents rounded up Shirley Hankton and others related to or associated with the family. The DA's office says a relative of Telly Hankton tried to sneak into the courthouse posing as a juror and using a side entrance. The jury began deliberating in this case on Friday and handed down a verdict around 2 o'clock this afternoon. Now, Telly Hankton was charged with nearly a dozen racketeering charges, and he was found guilty on nine of those charges. Those guilty verdicts were handed down on three charges of murder and eight of racketeering, also three charges of causing death through the use of a firearm. He's also guilty on other conspiracy charges. Now, Hankton and four other defendants pleaded not guilty to charges that they were part of an operation that started trafficking drugs in the mid 90s, which led to violence and murder. Hankton is already serving a life sentence on a state murder charge for killing Darnell Stewart. He was charged in federal court with murder and aid of racketeering and Stewart's 2008 death and the murder of Darvin Bessie and Jesse Reed. Now, one of the cases in the trial centered around the killing of five teens in Central City back in 2006. Prosecutors claim that Hankton was the gunman who killed those teens. On trial with Hankton was also alleged gunman Walter Porter and two of Hankton's cousins, Andre Hankton and Kevin Jackson. Now, Hankton's mother, Shirley, also pleaded guilty to racketeering charges back in May. His prison sentence. Telly Hankton, once dubbed one of the city's most dangerous criminals, was sentenced earlier today. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Hankton was convicted of murdering Darnell Stewart outside of a bar on South Claiborne. The streets of Central City in New Orleans once echoed with the name Telly Hankton, a drug lord whose reign of terror culminated in a federal courtroom. Hankton, alongside his associates, faced a series of charges that painted a grim picture of the city's underworld. Telly Hampton, the central city drug kingpin, along with the town hitman Walter Porter and Hampton's cousins, Andre Hampton and Kevin Jackson, were put on trial. The jury delivered a decisive blow, finding Hampton guilty on 28 of the 35 charges in the racketeering case against him. Among the heinous crimes, both Hankton and Porter were convicted on three counts of murder in aid of racketeering. This charge alone carries a life prison term. Mayor Mitch Landrieu, in a statement, expressed relief, noting that Hankton and his associates had terrorized our streets for years. He further added that they epitomized the deeply entrenched culture of violence in New Orleans. The prosecution painted Hankton as a vengeful enforcer of a cocaine monopoly, with his operations centered around the family's stronghold on Josephine Street. His illicit activities spanned over two decades, as per a federal indictment from 2012. This indictment implicated Hankton and his associates in five murders, all allegedly committed to safeguard their drug empire. The case saw most of the 13 original defendants, predominantly Hankton family members, with nine, including Telly Hankton's mother, Shirley, pleading guilty even before the trial commenced. Hankton was no stranger to the prison system. He was already serving a life sentence from a 2011 state murder conviction for the killing of Darnell Durney Stewart in May 2008. The jury, in this federal case, also found him guilty of the March 2006 killing of rival Darvin Bassey and the June 2009 murder of Jesse Tutu Reed. The victims, it emerged, had posed a challenge to Hankton's exclusive drug territory, 
leading to a feud that had its origins in the early 2000s. The chain of violence was set into motion with the December 2007 murder of George Cup Hankton, brother to Andre Hankton, allegedly at the hands of Stuart and Reed. Witness accounts painted a chilling picture of Walter Porter, described as a hitman who not only sought business from the Hanktons, but also boasted about his deeds. Porter, already on the brink of a life sentence for an unrelated contract killing in Gretna, was convicted on three counts of murder in aid of racketeering. It's after one of the city's most high-profile murders, federal investigators say police arrested the wrong guy. Michael Anderson was accused of shooting five teens in Central City back in 2006, but federal prosecutors say he was not the one responsible. And instead, they're pointing the finger at Telly Hankton, a man who's been called the crime boss of New Orleans. WDSU News reporter Travis Mackle is here with what this means for Anderson, who was first charged for this. Well, most likely nothing because his convictions were vacated years ago, but the fact the feds now say Hankton is is the trigger man could prove detrimental at his upcoming murder trial. On this quiet Central City street corner today, no one wanted to talk about the killing that happened almost a decade ago. It's always been rumored that reputed crime boss Telly Hankton could be involved, and now the feds believe that's true. In the intricate web of New Orleans drug underworld, Names like Michael Anderson and Telly Hankton stand out prominently. Their tales, intricately interwoven with the fabric of Central City, serve as a testament to the labyrinthian workings of the drug trade, the violence it engenders, and the impact it has on the communities ensnared within it. This narrative sheds light on the tumultuous journey of Michael Anderson, his connections with the influential Hankton family, and the events that led them to intersect in unpredictable ways. In July 1983, Michael Anderson testified in court. He was asked about his background in criminal history, as he was currently serving a life sentence after pleading guilty to several charges, including conspiracy to commit RICO and drug-related offenses. Michael grew up in Central City, New Orleans, and began selling drugs at the age of 13, starting with marijuana and later moving on to selling crack cocaine. He received guidance from a man named George Jackson, known as Black, who provided him with drugs to sell. Michael would sell drugs every day and eventually expanded his operation, obtaining larger quantities of crack. George Jackson was connected to the Hankton family, and they played a significant role in the drug distribution in the area. Michael stated that Telly Hankton supplied drugs to George and other dealers in the neighborhood, including himself. The area was bustling with drug buyers, and Michael and other dealers sold drugs directly to them on the streets. Telly Hankton was known for distributing large quantities of cocaine, ranging from quarter keys to multiple ounces. The drug trade in the neighborhood was thriving, and the Hankton family played a prominent role in supplying drugs to various dealers in the area. Conversation takes place in a neighborhood where Michael grew up with friends like Brian Broussard, who was like an older brother to him. Brian and his companions, Derek and Terrell Smothers, were deeply involved in the drug trade. They formed a close-knit group and the entire neighborhood felt like one big family. George, a friend of Michael, provided him with a gun at the age of 16 to protect himself while getting involved in drug dealing. George also became Michael's his initial drug supplier, giving him crack cocaine when he was just starting out. As Michael's involvement in the drug trade increased, George continued to supply him with drugs earning trust and building a business relationship. Michael eventually began buying larger quantities of drugs, specifically a quarter kilo of crack cocaine. To afford this, Michael used money he received from his mother's fire insurance claim after their house was tragically burned down during Hurricane Katrina. Instead of using the money to replace belongings lost in the fire, he invested it in buying more drugs to expand his business. As the Michael drug dealings grew, he started working with Telly as well. 
Michael continued buying drugs from both George and Telly, building a reputation as a reliable customer who paid back his debts promptly. However, despite his success, he faced multiple arrests over the years due to his involvement in drug-related activities. These arrests interrupted his operations, but he always returned to the drug trade once he was released. Michael's reputation as a reliable customer who paid back debts promptly grew. Even though he faced multiple arrests due to his involvement in drug-related activities, Michael Anderson needed to get in touch with someone. He flagged Telly Hankton down when he saw him driving a Cadillac Escalade down the street. Michael got in Telly call, gave him $150, and told him what he wanted. Telly Hankton took the money, and they went to a house. Inside, Michael showed him $150 again, but Telly claimed it was short, so Michael had to give him the full amount. He then gave Michael crack cocaine in a brown paper bag Michael testified. Time in the neighborhood, Telly didn't want any unnecessary attention or suspicion from law enforcement, so he asked Pluck to stop parking his fancy car on Josephine Street. Telly didn't want people to assume that Pluck was involved in drug dealing for him just because of the car's appearance. He wanted to avoid any potential issues that might arise due to the perception of Pluck being associated with his drug activities. At the time, Pluck was selling drugs, and Pluck wasn't buying from Telly. Pluck felt that if you weren't buying drugs from Telly, he didn't want you around his people. Telly operated from right there. And if the police caught anyone else dealing near him, it could create a conflict. Telly asked Pluck to move his car around the corner, and he complied. However, when Telly told him to stop hanging on the porch, Pluck got upset and questioned why Telly was bothering him when others weren't saying anything. Telly told Pluck to get off the porch, and they had a heated exchange, with Pluck expressing his frustration. Later, while at a house on 2011 Street, Pluck vented his anger about Telly, saying he wanted to harm him or even kill him. During this conversation, there was no agreement among them to carry out any violence against Telly. After some time, Pluck and Dudu got shot. On another occasion, while walking home one night, Michael saw Telly coming in an S10 truck on the street off Jackson. He parked the truck and approached me, asking why Michael was looking at him a certain way. Michael told him I had no issue with him and had nothing to do with any problems he had with Pluck. He mentioned talking to my big brother Bubba, but Michael asserted that he was my own man and had no conflicts with him. The conversation ended with Telly getting back into his car and driving off. It was the last conversation Michael had with him based on that situation. After that, sometime in early 2004, between Jackson Street and Josephine Street, I was sitting in a yard with a gate and a plum tree on Saratoga selling drugs in the dark to avoid police attention. Michael heard two gunshots, and when I looked, I saw Pluck and Telly near Pluck's car. More gunshots followed, and then I saw Pluck running. I couldn't see who was shooting, but someone fired several more shots up the street. When Michael Anderson saw Telly running away, he was about two houses away from him, and Michael could clearly see him with a rag around his neck and a hat on his head. Michael was standing behind the gate in front of a porch at the time. After witnessing the shooting, Michael went around to his house and stayed around the corner, thinking about what had just happened. Eventually, he heard the ambulance and saw them putting up tape. Michael walked back around and saw two ambulances, one near the house of Durning and Toya and another near the bar room on Simon Bolivar and St. Andrew Street. They said that Dudu had passed out when he got shot. Michael called a girl he knew to take him to the hospital, where many people from the Hampton family and their neighborhood gathered. Everyone wanted to know what was happening with Pluck. Michael didn't get to see Pluck that night because they rushed him to surgery due to the gunshot wound. After Michael Anderson got out of prison in March 2005, he found out that Pluck had been shot again in 2005. Darnell Stewart 
Pluck and Dudu Robinson were in a car when they encountered Michael on Jackson Street. Pluck asked him if he had a gun, to which Michael responded that he didn't. Pluck mentioned that they had just gotten into a confrontation with Pee Wee on Josephine LaSalle. Pluck and Dudu eventually got shot on Washington and LaSalle, allegedly by Pee Wee and Rel. Michael also encountered Telly Hankton in jail, Wise. The first time, Telly was wanted for Darnell Stewart's murder, but he bonded out. The second time, Telly was in jail for another murder. They spoke in the shower on the same floor, and Telly mentioned that he had a witness coming forward against him in the upcoming trial for Darnell Stewart's murder. Telly asked Michael to relay a message to Derek's mothers, who was good friends with Telly, to not write letters or communicate with him during the trial. In federal custody in 2012, while Michael Anderson was in the holding tanks on the docks, he encountered Walter Porter, whom he knew from his case and jail situation. Michael struck up a conversation with Walter and mentioned hearing about him being involved in the killing of Kenny Robinson, also known as Skunk. Walter confirmed this and said that someone named Slim had paid him to do it. Michael knew Kenny from their neighborhood and was aware of the ongoing issues between Kenny, also known as Skunk. Walter didn't disclose the specific amount he was paid for the killing. Michael Anderson's story, from the streets of Central City to the cold confines of prison, paints a vivid picture of the drug trade's relentless grip on individuals and communities. Through his interactions with Telly Hankton and others, we get a glimpse into the complexities and perils of life on the edge, marked by trust, betrayal, violence, and survival. The intricate tales of both Michael and Telly serve as a haunting reminder of the real human costs of a system that, for many, offers a way out, but at immeasurable risks.